Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, praise team, for leading us into the presence of the Lord. If you have your Bibles and will turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 24, we'll begin reading in verse number 13. 1 Samuel 24. Actually, we're going to begin reading in verse 3. I'm, I'm going to um, read several verses of Scripture here. And um, we're going to read together kind of old-fashioned. Is that all right? How many remember when the church used to read congregationally the text? We're going to, we're going to do that today because I have about... Uh, 12 or so verses of scripture and so I'm going to read the first couple of verses and then about verse 5 I want you to pick up begin to read with me and I know our media team is going to be on their toes and get us quickly to the next verse and uh, beginning in about verse 5 I'm going to fade in and out I'm going to read with you off and on and uh, but we're going to read this together since there is uh, quite a collective of scriptures to read and uh, that that will help uh, all of us. Amen. How many is going to help read the word of the Lord with us? Amen. First Corinth, excuse me, first Samuel 24 and beginning in verse number three. And he came to the sheep, to the sheep coats by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David rose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately, joined with me, and it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. Can I just stop and say this? Let me just pause. This is so foreign to modern day Christians. David's men were encouraging him. See, they were hiding in a cave, and Saul slipped into that cave. And David snuck up behind Saul, cut off an edge of his robe, and went back over to his men, still hiding, showed it to them, and they began to rejoice and said, See, this is the day that it was foretold and prophesied that God is going to deliver your enemies into your hand. Be careful the advice you take even from saved people. Because it's never God's will to attack the anointed. I know that's not popular anymore. We don't talk about that. Because we are so divisive and divided, not just as a nation, but even in the body of Christ. That we feel comfortable attacking people that don't see things the way we see them. And they said, look, the Lord delivered him into your hand. Go cut his throat. Kill him. It'll, it'll all be over. This man that's been hunting you down like a dog. And then David said, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. In other words, I'm still submitting. I've got to have headship, even with my headships trying to murder me. He said to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Amen. we got to be careful how quick we're willing to draw the sword of our tongue to cut somebody else in the church that we have a disagreement with. I know it's popular right now to label everybody. Oh, they're a Nazi. Oh, they're a racist. Oh, they're a fascist. Oh, they're a this. That mess don't belong in the church. The accusations we need to be given is, that's my brother. That's my sister. We can disagree without being disagreeable. I don't have to murder their character and their integrity to make me right. All right, that's not a part of my message. Let's read on verse number seven. So David stayed his servants with these words, 
and suffer them. Come on, read with me. Suffer them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, Now he's yelling at him, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. He could have killed him. Every, if this, if, if chapter 24 would have been written differently and David slipped out of the shadows and plunged the knife into the base of his skull, we would be shouting that God delivered him over his enemies. But that's not how David saw it. David still reverenced the man, even though he was wrong. So much that he come out of the cave behind him, weeping, weeping, Master, and he bowed himself and his face to the earth. Verse 9, let's read again. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee unto mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee. But mine eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against thee, Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. Keep reading. The Lord heard his hand and the Lord said unto me, Thus for my hand shall not be upon thee, after they have brought thee into the wilderness. Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee, after whom. Of Israel come out. After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thy hand. Verse 14 again. After whom is the king of Israel come out? Listen to what he's asking. Who is the king hunting? Who are you pursuing? Who are you hunting? A dead dog? The flea on the dead dog? That's who I am in comparison to you. I am but a flea on a dead dog. Why are you pursuing me? Then in verse 15, he said, let's just let the Lord deal with this. We'll let the Lord be the judge. I want to read one portion of scripture. It's not going to really make sense that it really ties into this. And hopefully by the end of my message this morning, I'll be able to weave in this particular verse. In John 21, 17, Jesus saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all th things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Amen. Now last Sunday, what an amazing service we had last Sunday. I was hoarse all the way up till Thursday. I didn't hardly have a voice from Sunday. Somebody asked at the campground I was talking to a retired Marine voice cracked and he says have you been sick I said no I've been preaching should have seen the look on his face amen last Sunday we're up here in the height of emotion and shouting there was breakthroughs and miracles how many left here last Sunday triumphant over your enemy this Sunday we're going to swing in a, in, in a different direction and I thank God for the, I think everybody knows that. I love to shout and I love to dance. 
I think that's important. We need that type of preaching and that music. But if truth be known, those, those of us that have been here and been living for God for any amount of time, 15, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, can tell you, I look at the times where I shouted and the miracles God gave, and that was powerful, and I, I memorialize that. But it was in the deep place that God spoke to my spirit. It was through the sobbing. It was through the intercession. It was through the prayer. Amen. And so if it's all right, I'm not changing gears to slow down. I'm changing gears to climb up. All right? And I, I want to, I don't, please don't get lost in what might seem to be the heaviness of this. But I, I want to preach to you on this thought, the catastrophic consequences of constant comparison. The catastrophic consequences of constant comparison. There is a disease in the body of Christ that we leave chronically unchecked. And that is the disease of constantly comparing ourselves to one another. Amen. I pray that the Lord would help us this morning. And I pray that he would speak to us through his word and that we would be challenged when we, before we leave here. And I pray that before we're done today, that we would humble ourselves before the Lord and let God purge out of us any of those things that might cause a catastrophe in our life because our eyes are more upon us and others than upon the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word that is not only anointed, but Lord, this word that speaks life, transformation, and direction. Lord, I pray that you would help captivate our attention this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us to lock in and focus in onto what your word is speaking to us today. I pray, Lord, that you would allow these words to come through my mouth, anointed by your Spirit. Lord, I pray that before we leave, that we will be nearer to the cross than when we walked in today. I thank you for your church. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your blood. I thank you for forgiveness. And I thank you for what you're about to do in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Let's just thank the Lord, can we, for just a moment. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, before you're seated, look at somebody and tell them, put your seatbelt on. Amen. We're, gonna, we're, we're climbing up the rough side this morning. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. The Army slogan, be all you can be. How many remember that that be? Do you remember that? You remember the commercial that come on and say, be all that you can be in the army. It, it, it is said to be the greatest marketing campaign in history. Be all that you can be. But I want to tell you this morning, the best that you can be has an enemy. Too many times I'm afraid the devil fools us and tricks us into measuring ourselves among ourselves. It's a dangerous thing to try and be all that you can be and be the best that you can be when you are comparing yourselves among yourself. The enemy wants you to measure yourself against those that are sitting in this room right now. He wants you to measure yourself against the other young people in the youth group, among the other singles in the church, among the other hyphen, among the other marrieds, among everyone around us. The enemy would get us to focus on those around us that we would use them as a measuring stick. He wants you to measure yourself against everyone that is here. He wants you to ask yourself, 
when you feel a little conviction about your walk with God or your pursuit of righteousness and holiness and your desire for excellence. He wants you to ask yourself, well, I wonder if I am doing better than he is or she is. That's how the enemy of our soul works. He doesn't always come and tempt us uh, with the needle of heroin or with the drink of beer or with the uh, extramarital affair. Oftentimes the enemy is coming to us and he is telling us to, oh, not make that level of commitment because look at those around you. You're doing better than they are. And unfortunately, we tend to feel good when we look around and see that some of our peers and that some of our other family members around us are not doing what they need to be doing, but we feel we are in constant comparison when those around us, the Spirit of the Lord is drawing us to more prayer and more devotion and more reading of God's Word and more consecration. And I'm not asking for a show of hands here this morning because I know I'm speaking to a plight that every one of us deal with. To what measure we deal with it could be debatable but the fact is every one of us deal with this it is not only human nature but it is the human nature in which the enemy of our soul has found an alliance in this battle of living for God to say why should I pray more when I know they're not praying more why should I be more faithful when I know that they are not I'm doing better than she is or he is with my holiness and with my convictions why why should I pursue any more? And oftentimes you'll find out that the enemy of great is just good enough. Am I telling the truth yet this morning? If we're not careful, we're going to look at those around us that are not doing what they should be doing and get a sense of approval that because they're not doing what they should be doing, that we're doing okay. What, what is okay? What is okay? One murderer may say, I'm okay, I've only killed two people. That guy over there killed 35 people. Oh, I know it's a pretty extreme example. But every one of us deal with that constantly as the Lord draws each and every one of us to a deeper walk and a deeper commitment with him. We'll almost tell ourselves, I must be doing pretty good after all. At least we're not backsliding. At least we still go to church. At least my kids aren't acting like their kids. The devil will tend to pat us on the back and let us know that we're doing okay and there's no need to pursue any further or any more than what we're doing right now. I, I know we're not shouting with the organ right now. I, 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 I need to dig in today. Because the enemy of our soul wants to constantly tell us any time that we want to consecrate more, any time we want to move closer to the Lord, the enemy of your soul and your flesh is going to look to the person to the right and to the left, to the front and to the back and say, well, I'm doing better than some, so why don't I just stay where I am right now? The Bible, however, tells us that we are not to use this kind of a measuring stick. The Bible tells us that if we compare ourselves among among ourselves that we do not well. The enemy will pat you on the back. Let me say that again. The enemy will pat you on the back. The devil will congratulate you if it leads you into the lane of mediocrity. The enemy will encourage you to just stay in the safe zone of I'm okay. The enemy will pat you on the back and tell you, that you're doing a good job as long as you're not pursuing God any more than what you are right now. For the enemy of our soul knows that the most, one of the most dangerous things that a believer can do is fall into a rut of just being okay in my walk with God. Oh, I could pray more. I could be more faithful to church. I could be more active in reading my Bible. I could be involved in more ministry. I could be involved in trying to disciple someone or leading someone 
someone to the Lord, but, but I, I'm doing all right. After all, I'm not like they are. I'm at church more than they are. I'm certain I'm faithful in my giving more than some are. But that was never a measuring stick of our spirituality. We're not to measure ourselves among ourselves, but we are to measure ourselves to the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm doing as good as this one. I'm doing as good as that one. I'm doing a little better than him or I'm doing a little better than her. Amen. I'm telling you the reason why we're not supposed to do that is because it is an inaccurate measuring stick to compare ourselves with someone else. I'm not as bad as they are. I'm not saying I'm any better, but I'm definitely not any worse. Oh, God, help me this morning to open his word to us today to say that what we need is more of Jesus and less of ourselves. What we need is more reaching and striving to press toward the mark and less of saying I'm okay on the level where I am. We need less of saying I'm doing good enough and more of saying you know what I think I can do better. We need less of saying I've done my part and more of saying I'll do my part and more because Jesus didn't stop in Pilate's court and Jesus didn't stop on the road. Amen to the cross and Jesus didn't stop with the crown of thorns or the nails but Jesus said I've still got more to give and he gave his all upon the cross of Calvary and that is the thing in which we are supposed to measure ourselves because the real measuring stick is not how I am doing in comparison to someone else it is how am I doing and how far do I have to go to be what God created me to be and what God designed me to be. I understand that the timing of this message this morning is quite a bit inconvenient. Right in the middle of 2020, when everything is upside down, when everything is out of order, when our life is not going the way we had planned it to go in January, just a few months ago, when our job is not what it, we planned it to be, amen, this time last year, when everything is upside down and inside out, uh, amen, the danger is to look at one another and say, compared to them, I'm doing good. Compared to them, I'm okay. I'm not like this one. I'm not like, don't you understand? That's what Jesus rebuked when he tried to teach them on prayer. When they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray, he said, don't you be like those Pharisees uh, that put their hands on their robes uh, and they dishevel their hair and they pray and they say I thank thee father that I am not like this sinner over here and I'm not like that sinner over there now I know we don't use those exact words uh, but it's easy to look at the church across town that is compromising it's easy to look at the gathering across the way amen or around the corner or in another town and say but we're doing better than they are. That's not what we're supposed to measure ourselves to. Why don't we measure ourselves to the cross? Why don't we measure ourselves to the word of God? I want to be like Jesus, not like you. Amen. We used to sing the old song, to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him all through life's journey from earth to glory I only ask to be like him that should be the cry of our hearts today I don't want to be like them. Oh, I thank God for the elders. I thank God for those in this church and leadership. I thank God for those that are pillars and stalwarts of our church that are consistent day in and day out. And yes, there were those and there are still those that I look up to and say, I want to be like they are. I want to attain what they are. But I'm afraid that in our world today and in the church today, and understand, I'm not talking particularly about our assembly. I'm talking about the church at large 
amen, there's a whole lot less of I want to be in the level of prayer that they have. I want their level of consecration and there's a whole lot more of, but I'm not like they are. I shout more than they do. I go to church more than they do. I love God more than them. Amen. I'm doing better than they are. There's a whole lot more of that than there is of make me like you, Jesus. Make me like you, Jesus. I'm concerned and offset when I get to looking around and recognizing that I am not hearing some of the things that we need to hear today. It bothers me that the tone of the church is more on earthly things than on eternal things. Oh, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good today. I'm not hearing the things. That, I'm a young guy. Listen, I get it. I'm young. I'll, I'll be 40 in a couple of months. I get it. I'm young, but I've been doing this for a little while. And I already the vocabulary that we were hearing when I was a young person seems to be lost among so many young people. Where are the young people aspiring to ministry? Now, thank God we got some in our church. But where is that drive for young people that want to be in ministry? This will probably go to the bottom of the list of sermons I enjoyed in 2020. Where are the young people that are aspiring to be missionaries? That is their life goal. I want to be a missionary and I'm working on a foreign language right now. Where are the young people that are saying, I want to be mightily and greatly used of God. I read an article not too long ago about the lack of youth going into ministry. Parents, I need you to hear me. And young people, I need you to hear me. I read an article about youth, the lack of youth going into ministry. And the article said that by the year 2030, that is 10 years away, by the year 2030, there will not be enough preachers to fill pulpits as pastors and ministers in the churches in North America. Why is this taking place? What is it that is stopping youth and families from becoming the best of what God has called them to be? Why is it that it seems that so many families are satisfied as long as their young people have not backslid or quit going to church? as if that is the highest level of attainment that we can have an expectation for our children that as long as they just still come to church. When did we lower the bar for being a Christian? I can hear people tuning me out right now. The channel in the mind's clicking. Click, 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 click. When was that the ultimate of living for God that at least they're not backslid? And I thank God that our young people are here. And I thank God that our young people are making a decision to come to the house of the Lord. And I thank God, young people, that you're not fighting your parents to be here this morning. At least I hope you weren't. But I want to tell you, there is more to living for God than just taking up a chair in a sanctuary. There's more to living for God than just being present. There's more to living for God than just being at church. the greatest hope and aspiration of a parent become if they can just be living for God. Now I get it. I get it for parents that are struggling with children that aren't serving God. I know what you're saying in your heart and rightfully so. I just wish my kids were here today. I get it but I'm preaching to the parents that are present and the young people that are here right now. Your greatest calling in living for God is not being a warm spot on a pew. Your greatest calling in living for God is being all that you can be for the Lord. Why is it that just, it's all, well, they're coming to church. And, I'm, and I'm, I hope you don't understand, I'm not downplaying that. But God have mercy on us whenever our greatest aspiration for our children is simply that they get a good education, go to college, 
get a good job, drive a nice car, live in a nice brick house and attend church and maybe teach Sunday school class or sing in the choir. Somewhere, if we do not raise the bar, the prayer rooms are going to go silent and the intercessors are going to disappear. The highest aspiration of living for God should not be just being here on Sunday and Tuesday. Your highest aspiration in living for God should be, Lord, whatever you call me to do, I'm going to do it with all of my heart. If you call me to be a janitor, there will never be a cleaner floor in a church than the one that I clean. And that is nothing to look down upon because David said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I want to tell you right now, mom and daddy, saints, you better listen to me right now. I hope you feel the heart of your pastor this morning. I'm not upset at anybody. I'm not frustrated with any particular individual. I'm just shaking to my core right now that we are just happy that our young people People come to church and we have got to raise the bar in their expectation of living for God. That's why I tell our kids all the time, you're going to be a missionary. You're going to be a church planner. You're going to be a pastor. You're going to be an evangelist. You're going to be a teacher. You've got to put it in them that there is nothing in this world that is more fulfilling than to be what God has called you to be. I'm not against education. I'm not against education. I'm not against a good career. But I'm going to tell you right now, there's not a whole lot within me that wants to send my daughter to those brainwashing factories they call colleges. They go in Christ wise and come out Christ dumb. They come in certain of their salvation and walk out questioning even the existence of God. I thank God for our hyphen. I thank God for Brother Nate having a passion for a hyphen group and our young people that are in university that are serving God. But I want to tell our hyphen something. Your greatest achievement in this life will not be an associate's, a master's, a bachelor's, or a doctorate degree. Your greatest achievement in life is being what God has called you to be. I want my I want my daughter and if there's more kids to come how many ever whatever God wills I want them to be better off than I am I want them, I want them to have the things that I couldn't have I want them to go the places I couldn't go I, I want them to own the things I couldn't own but not at the cost of their soul I'd rather you go to heaven poor than go to hell rich And if a college degree is what society considers smart, I'd rather you go to heaven dumb than go to hell smart. If everybody in this church above the age of 50 died, where would we be? We live in a society in a generation that's all about the me and it's all about the now. The problem is, they're geniuses when it comes to theory, but they're morons when it comes to experience. Case in point, these dimwits up in Seattle that take over a six by, and you can get mad at me if you want to. If you support that, you need to pray through. That is anarchy and that is against the word of God. And you've got a sex trafficking leader that's running the whole thing and they call him a warlord. And we got Christians going, oh, but this is what needs to be done. Really? Really? When they're calling in rapes all day long in that six block radiance? You know what? There's a bunch of rich kids playing revolutionaries because they went to colleges and had their minds poisoned by a bunch of socialist, communist professors. Now, you get mad at it if you want to, and that's fine. You get glad in the same shoes you got mad in. 
We're going to be revolutionaries like, 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 like Castro. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, but what that professor's not telling you about Castro is they executed homosexuals and you would go to prison for life for listening to rock music. Oh, I know you don't want to hear that. We want a revolution like Mao. Yeah, well, Mao only had to kill about 100 million people to get that revolution. I look at young people today raising their fists wanting communism in America. You're against communism? Absolutely I am. The greatest killer in the history of mankind has been communism, socialism, and fascism in the 20th century. It killed over 150 million people and we're still debating whether it's a good idea or not. And these dimwits up in Seattle kicked out the police said we don't want any police. Ironically enough, there's a video of a street preacher who had enough courage to go into that six block radius and start preaching about Jesus and they got on him and they started choking the life out of him saying, shut up, we're the police now. I just found it ironic that the first thing they did when they wanted to be their own nation is they put up walls and armed men at the walls. See, they're heavy in theory, but they're light in experience. It just dawned on these 20-something-year-olds, they got to have something to eat. Have you seen their garden? They laid down about 500 feet of cardboard, poured about two inches of soil on it, and set potted plants on top of it and said, we're going to be autonomous from the world. Are you listening to me? We've got young people that are hungry for change in their world and they're so hungry for change that they're willing to go to the extremes that mass murderers did and pick up their rhetoric and pick up their style. But I'm telling you, God is wanting to raise up some revolutionaries in the church that want a revolution for the body of Christ, that want the power of the Holy Ghost put back in their schools. Hey Amen, that's what we need. You want to end racism? Expand the church. You want to end injustice? Expand the church. Now, I did not mean to. You can see my notes. That's not in my notes. But we've got people standing back going, oh, this is the change. Really? Really? I'm looking at this and going, this is what happens to a generation that didn't get their rear ends tore up. They're throwing fits. and This is why Dr. King didn't burn down cities. Because Dr. King got his rear end tore up by a mama and a daddy that wouldn't tolerate a temper tantrum. And now we've got cities burning down because you've got a bunch of kids that are spoiled and throwing temper tantrums. Anybody hearing what I'm saying today? Had they got their hide busted with a belt a few times, they let me move on. I, I can tell right now. Facebook's probably going to take this down since they're such a great modicum of free speech. Such a great medium of free speech. that We got church people supporting this. Anarchy. If God is anything, God is a God of order. I said if God is anything, he's a God of order. And the first documented arrest we see happening up in Seattle is them choking out a preacher for preaching. If you think that this new wave of revolutionaries wants Christianity, you are smoking something. Somewhere we've got to raise the bar for our young people and let them know you can affect change in the world through the church. Let me say it again. Young people, you can affect change in this world and you can do it living for God and you'll have a far more lasting impact. Raise the bar with your young people. Bring them to prayer meeting tomorrow night. Teach them how to pray. There ought to be a house full of young people at prayer on Monday night. Why? We've got to teach them. There's more to living for God than coming to church on Sunday morning. I'm fired up. I'm 
fired up this morning. Our greatest asset is sitting in this building right now. It's our young people, and we're just trying to poop them along to live for God. No, get on fire. Let God use you. There's never been a greater revolutionary than Jesus Christ. He overthrew the gates and the powers of death, hell, and the grave. He flipped the script on the enemy and he gives a life. I'm not even looking at my phone right now. I, I'm sure somebody's going to report this as hate speech. You know, I, I've played nice long enough. I played nice long enough. Because you know what hate speech is to a bunch of these morons? Hate speech is whatever they don't agree with. Oh, and if you support that, get ready. Because one day it's going to flip. And you don't want it to flip the other direction. Every time it flips. Well, that's just hate speech. You can't say they're dimwits up there. Yes, I can. They're being foolish. They're being foolish. So they've started their own. I just cannot get over this, Brother Nate. I cannot get over this. What I have learned about a lot of these folks is whatever they accuse you of is secretly what they're doing. Now, I don't care what your opinion. I don't mean to be political, but I'm, I'm a little fired up this morning. It was amazing that a year ago, a wall was considered racist. But the first thing these revolutionaries did was put up a wall and put up a bunch of Call of Duty gamers with long rifles to guard it. We want freedom. Yeah, your type of freedom. That's called totalitarianism. Young people. God has not called you to go tear down a city. God has not called you to tear. I only know the Bible speaking of one kind of person that tears things down. Jesus said, for the enemy cometh. The thief cometh, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He said, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have life more. I want to be on the side of life. I want to be the side on the side of abundance. I want our young people to say, yes, we can protest injustice. Yes, we can call for more equality, but bless God, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm about building people up, not tearing them down. I'm about loving, not hating. Is this all right this morning? I'm talking about the catastrophic consequences of constant comparison. This is what's happening in our world right now. The catastrophe we're dealing with is the constant comparison. Where well, they're only rich because they took it from me. Most people I compl hear complain about people having too much money are the people too lazy to get a job and work and do what it takes to get money. Oh, don't shout me down when I'm preaching. That's the truth. You want to change the world? Start with making up your bed, cleaning your room, and balancing your check account. Then you come and straighten up my house. Work a job. Then tell me something. Until then, sit down. Pastor, you're going to turn off people. There's an opportunity to reach them. No, there's an opportunity to show them a better way that there's a life. It is not the will of God to destroy. It's the will of God for life, 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 and that more abundantly. Our greatest asset is sitting in this church right now. I said our greatest assets are in this church right now. And it's young people who will get on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ and turn this city upside down for Jesus. Not burn it to ashes for a cause, but turn it upside down for Jesus. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Nothing ought to fire us up more than seeing our young people dancing. Nothing ought to get us more excited than seeing our young people in the altar. Nothing ought to stir our hearts more than seeing our young people preaching and teaching and singing and being involved in ministry. 
it is said of Beethoven that his best works died with him. Beethoven died in his early 30s. They recognized that he did not have time to fully develop. It is said that the greatest, most intricate compositions of music were never heard because it went to a grave much too early. As great as he was in his 30s, imagine how great he would have been in his 60s. I am convinced that there are young people and families sitting all over this church right now who and all over our movement right now of whom the best is yet to come. I said the best is yet to come. Look at somebody and tell them he's talking about me right now. Come on, look at him and point at yourself and say he's talking about me. I said the best has yet to come. We have never been closer to the rapture of the church than we are right now. We have never been closer to the end time than we are right now. Get ready, I'm fixing to start preaching on prophecy and eschatology and it's gonna peel your hair back when I tell you how close we are to the rapture of the church. But here's the good news. God's going to raise up a generation that is a, that is powerful. And God's going to raise up a generation of young people and young adults that are passionate about ministry. Not passionate about a 401k or a degree, but they're passionate about ministry. I believe this church can turn out 10 pastors, 10 missionaries, 10 church planners. Oh, somebody lift your hands to the Lord if you believe that. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. (laughs) Now that I've said that, let me flip the coin over and tell you something else. Hey Amen. Let me tell you something else. Yeah, we point at them and we know that and those that are, that are doing all this stuff and destroying stuff, hey amen, that's not right. That's not of God. We don't support that. But let me tell you this, mom and dad, it's easy to compare yourself. It's easy to say, well, at least that ain't my young people. At least that ain't my kids out there doing that. At least it ain't my kids out there calling for that kind of stuff. But let me ask you something, mom and dad. You may be thankful they're not out there doing that, but are you content? with them just showing up to church and just coming to church just sitting on a pew just doing a little bit or would you stoke a fire in your young people and say we'll be at prayer on Monday night you'll be at church on Tuesday night you'll be at every youth event we're going to get involved in ministry I'm not going to push you to do it I'm going to lead you into it I wonder what, God, I feel something. I'm I'm only on page four of eight. I've got to tell somebody something right now. If our young people, amen, young people, I'm not chastising you, I'm challenging you. You hear the heart of your pastor right now. What would happen in this city if our young people, God is devoted to the truth as other young people are to a lie. What would happen if our young people, God is excited about what God can do to change lives. That's what a revolution of politics could do to change society we would flip this city upon its head. There'd be a revival no building could hold. If we would encourage our young people, you're the change that this world needs. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Oh, but pastor, did you hear about those young people out there smoking dope and shooting up and doing drive-bys and joining gangs and cheer about this group of young people and they're getting caught up in this and that. At least my kids aren't like that. At least my, at least my kids are coming to church. No, at most your kids are coming to church. Does it matter where they go to hell from, a pew or a bar? Does it really matter? Uh, let, let me ask that. Does it, it, is it better that they go to hell from a church than from a crack house? Does it make you feel better that at least they were faithful to church? 
but they didn't love God in their heart. And young people, let, let me lift the pressure off of you just a little bit. Is it any better? You can look at the world and say, yeah, my coworker cheats on his wife. and This coworker's a dope head. Is it better that you can come to church every week and still be lost? Are you really better than they are? Or does it just make you feel good to say, at least I'm not them? If the ultimate destination is the same, does it really matter how we get there? I'm convinced that God has given you a talent and God has put a gift inside you when you got the Holy Ghost. I want somebody to know here this morning you are a gift from God to the church. I said you are a gift from God to the church. You are a part of the family of God. You are special in the kingdom of God. God loves you. God's chosen you. God has called you to the kingdom for such a time as this. And it's time in the midst of 2020 that we shake ourselves and say, I am no longer contented with just coming to the house of God with just being a warm spot on a cold chair I'm not content with going through the motions I know it's June I know we're in the middle of a summer but I've come to tell you right now you can start something right now God can start using you right now come on lift those hands to the Lord I feel his spirit moving right now Come on, something's moving in this house right now. Come on, God's calling somebody right now. God's calling somebody right now. Come on, God is calling somebody right now to be more. He's calling you to do more. He's calling you to come out. He's calling you to come out. You can't be satisfied comparing yourselves among yourselves. Somebody's got to rise up right now and say this isn't good enough. Good enough isn't good enough anymore. Just good enough isn't good enough anymore. I'm going to be what God has called me to be. Come on, somebody, that's it. I need intercessors to start praying right now. Something's breaking forth in this house. Come on, God's spirit's breaking forth in this house. Come on, that's it, intercessor. Go ahead, lift that voice and intercede. Go ahead, Yanelli. You just keep interceding right now. I would to God. I have more young people, more parents, more adults that were interceding like that right now. Go ahead, Sister Priscilla. We need some intercessors right now. Thank you, Sister Henderson. Come on, that's it. Just keep interceding right now. Oh, God, I feel it. I pray to God they become CEOs. I pray to God they become heads of business if that's what God's called them to be. But if God's calling them to ministry, I pray that God will make them what he's called them to be. Come on, don't let that spirit creep in. Don't let your flesh rise up and say, no, 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 pastor, I'm good enough. I'm, I'm doing okay. I, I'm better than that one over there. I, I'm not as bad as that one over there. At least I'm not with, no, no, no. Right now, you need to say, God, make me all that I can be in your kingdom. I don't want the ca catastrophic consequences of comparing myself.
Come on, that's it. Stand with me. Lift those hands. The Spirit of the Lord's moving in this place. Somebody reaching out to heaven right now. Somebody reach out to heaven right now. Somebody get under a bird. And I feel some of you right now. But I wonder what would happen if, if about 50% of this church, young people and parents, got up under the load of the Holy Ghost right now and begin to pray intercessory prayer. Something's breaking forth. I believe God's going to call somebody into ministry today. I believe the Spirit of the Lord's calling somebody right now. I believe the Spirit of God is calling somebody right now. I thank God. I thank God for young adults like, like Sister Simone who's got a master's degree but she feels that God has called her into the mission field and she told me, Pastor, I want to do what God has called me to. That's what we need. That's what we need is somebody to say, oh, God, I want to be what you've called me to be. Listen to me. I'm about to open these altars. I feel the Spirit of the Lord here. God wants to squeeze the best out of you that He can get. I thank God for men like Elder Henderson. I, Brother Henderson, I thank God for you every day. Men like you. How long ago did you come into the church? About 22 years ago. Let me ask you something. If you were able to take a time machine back 35 years, would you have started serving God then? Because he's never told me this, but I can tell you from people like this man here who love God so passionately that if he has any regrets in lives, in his life, it's that he didn't serve God sooner and be able to give more of his best years to serving the kingdom of God. Young people, I know you don't ever think about this, but I want you, and adults, I want you to hear me. Listen, I'm not just preaching our young people. One of these days, if the Lord should tarry his coming, we don't like to think about it. I don't like being morbid. I don't want to think about it. But Sister Tish, one of these days, if you outlive me, and I hope you'll be there, they're going to put my body in a casket. They're going to lower this house of clay into the dirt. And nobody's going to stand at the head of my casket and say, this is how much money he died with. His house was this big. He drove this kind of a truck. Dear God, don't stand at my funeral and talk about toys and all the things and the fun and, I, and all that's a part. But the only measure of success is going to be when somebody can stand over that casket and say he gave everything he had to the kingdom of God. I don't think he could have done any more in reaching the lost planning churches, sending missionaries, raising up churches across the world. Nobody wants to hear about my retirement. Nobody wants to hear about if I rode horses and shot guns. And nobody wants to hear about riding Jessica. They don't want to, what I want to know is if on that day, the only measure of success is was I what God called me to be. That you not stand there and say, he was a better man than Hitler. He was a better man than this one. No, was I what God called me to be? God wants you. God wants you so desperately. God wants you. 
Satan is trying everything in his power to destroy you. He's not just trying to destroy you with heroin. He's not just trying to destroy you in immorality. But Satan is trying to destroy you with the disease and the cancer of constantly comparing ourselves. Young people, we're in a race against time. Parents, we're in a race against time. Elders, we're in a race against time to be all that God has called us to be. Xavier, I don't know what God's going to call you to do, buddy. I know you may want to be a fireman or you may want to do that, but whatever God calls you to do, do it with everything you've got and you'll be a success. Lucy, I don't know what you want to be when you get older. I don't know if you want to be a brain surgeon or an astronaut or whatever. But whatever God's calling you to do, if you be what he's called you to be, you'll be a success. Abraham, I don't know what you want to do with your life. I don't know what kind of college you want to go. I don't know, but I do know this. Whatever God's calling you to be, you got a mama right there that's going to pray for you to be everything you can be. You be what God's called you to be, and you'll be a success. We used to sing, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's great sway. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather have Jesus and be led by his strong hand. I'd rather have Jesus. Jesus than friends. I'd rather have Jesus than acceptance. I want to be like you, Jesus.